any parades or judges or prizes. This party is just going to suck. Oh, come on, it's going to be fun, and you all look great. I mean, look at you, Thor, and, and oh, Peter Pan, that's so cute. Actually, Penny, he's wrong. Not Peter Pan! Pixie dust with your name on it. No, you don't. I hate what Sheldon's supposed to be. Oh, he's the dog. Yes. It's the apparent change in the frequency of a wave caused by relative motion between the source of the wave and the observer. There you go. It may seem completely irrelevant to uh, what we're doing, but of course it's not. So um, what we'll talk about today is, well, what was, so what we've, uh, you've done so far, you spent the last two weeks talking about Bernoulli uh, equation, um, which is really a statement of conservation of momentum, basically a restatement of F equals MA. MA uh, acceleration is a rate of change of velocity, and mass times velocity is momentum, so it's a rate of change of um, momentum. And so we'll talk about conservation laws, is really what these three weeks are. This week we'll talk about conservation of mass or volume, which you've already had a bit of a, a feel for uh, from your uh, Bernoulli stuff. Area times velocity upstream of the streamline has to equal the area times velocity downstream. Um, and, but we'll talk about mass this week. We'll talk about conservation of momentum next week and conservation of energy the week before, actually. I think momentum and, and energy are switched. And so those are typical conservation equations that you'll see within your careers. If you're petroleum engineers or uh, environmental systems engineers, all the models that look at um, uh, groundwater flow or petroleum flow, porous media flow, are conservation of mass equations, which have conservation of momentum rolled into them through Darcy's law. And that might not mean anything to you now in your careers or not, but, but it's an important part of, of where you're going in your careers. So the reason that we have to talk about these kinds of things, so, so Doppler effect and also uh, the New York uh, fireboats, is that all of these relate to frames of reference. And we've already come across some of these frames of reference in some of the things we've done. I'm trying to think what the other one. Um, and so let's look at um, one other aspect like many, like many operations in the oil and gas service, service industry wireline, wireline operations is a 24 hour a day job crews may work, crews may work long, long hours in any type of weather to respond to customer needs must be canadian eh with a logo like that half a maple leaf on the truck so uh wireline logging so petroleum wells and actually environmental um audit wells as well. You drill a well, sometimes you drill it without taking core, you just punch it down with a tricone bit and chips come up the, the hole and get removed so you're removing the material but not actually logging it. So one way to log it is to put a, a geophysical sond down the hole afterwards. You drop this sond the full length of the hole and it records some property like electrical resistivity or acoustic velocity of the rock and how it varies with depth uh, or fluid rate of flow along the hole to look at entry of fluids into the hole and exits uh, at different points in the hole. And so you can use that to say something about the lithology um, of the system as you go down. <coughs> so this is uh, putting some kind of arrangement on top of this blowout preventer, the thing that keeps the well locked in. Uh, actually, I think it's just a well head in this case. Uh, to lock it in and then to drop this sun down the length of it and to run it down the, the, the hole. And so this is congruent with all the other things we looked at, Doppler effect, which is, of course, whatever he said, an apparent change in frequency by the, the, the distance, the separation between the source and observer. Car goes past you, 
it starts meow. So the, the frequency drops because when it's coming towards you, it's coming towards you and it's emitting at some frequency. So the frequency gets uh, compressed, so it's higher. And when it goes away, it's coming back at you while it's going further away. And so the waves get stretched out. So the frequency changes. So it matters where you observe. If you're in the car, it's exactly the same sound. It doesn't change. But to an observer, it changes as you go from one location to another. And so the fireboat is the same example as that because if you're standing on the fireboat and you're squirting water out at one meter a second out ahead of you, then you think you're squirting at one meter per second forward. If the boat is moving at one meter a second, then still, if you're on the boat, it's coming out at one meter a second relative to you, but to a static observer who's observing it, it's coming out at two meters a second or zero meters a second if it's going backwards at one meter a second, right? So, so the relative velocities make a, make a difference in all of this. And so the first thing that we'll talk about in all of this is really frames of reference, which I think is what we're going to, to deal with. What was the fine? I guess this is the fine. So anyway, so that's kind of where we are today. So what I might do is, so I'll step back a little bit from that and kind of summarize a little bit about what we've, we've done over the past, uh, you've done over the past uh, two weeks, really, uh, to say exactly where we are. And then we'll move ahead uh, in our usual way. All right. So, so what we did uh, in, I think, probably 4.2 to derive the equations for Bernoulli was that we took the, the differential equation we had for the pressure in a fluid at a static point, which includes the acceleration term, and we wrote that so it was defined along a streamline. And if we did that, we ended up with this expression exactly here. And it's divided into three components. But those components are basically a der derivative of the fact. Let me get rid of that. It's really just summing the fact that I can't write anymore. Sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration. These are really vectors, so there's forces in x, y, and z. But for the point of Bernoulli, it's always the force along a streamline and the acceleration along a streamline. The velocities are always along a streamline. And so in this, the one term that represents this, we could write this as a mass times a change in velocity with time. And what we're going to do today is we're going to see that we should probably be writing this as a mass times the change in a velocity with time. All that's different here is I'm writing this as an uppercase D, a substantial derivative, or the material derivative as sometimes it's called. And we could change this to look something like change in velocity with time multiplied by the distance along a streamline. This could be x or y, but it's along our streamline. And the reason for doing this is that this, by definition, if we wrote it out, is equal to mass times a change in velocity with location, right? This is the coordinate system, and, uh, and also the streamline velocity. And it's because this, this equation, Bernoulli, we know that we write it along a streamline that looks like this, from one location, one, to a second one. We could also think about writing it along a streamline as a stream tube, a parallel streamline. If that's the case, then we have a velocity along the streamline at point one, a velocity along the streamline at point two. I suppose we could talk about an area perpendicular to flow at the upstream level and an area perpendicular to flow at the downstream which are the essentials of Bernoulli. So in this Bernoulli expression, this, let me do this, 
This here represents the mass times acceleration term. It's dv, this acceleration. v squared is, a, we can, actually we did derive it, I'm sure. We derived it so that we get the v squared term out of, out of this term here, basically. And the other terms are the parts which uh, are equal to the force. This is the pressure force, if you like. And this is the elevation force, for want of a better term. So these terms, it's, it would have been better if I wrote it as v squared over 2g plus p over gamma plus z. Then I could have split it up into f equals ma. But there, this term is the one that is the destruction, if you like, of momentum. And so, in other words, the idea is if I take a ball and I throw it at the wall, when the ball hits the wall, it takes its velocity and it changes the velocity, it slows down, it decelerates, and it transmits that force to the wall. It's no different for a fluid. If you have to accelerate a fluid, maybe by squeezing it through a stream tube that gets a bit narrower, then you have to apply a force to push it through there. And that's, that's really what's going on. And so that's Bernoulli's expression. And so the important thing for us is that we've really defined a control volume, which is what we're talking about. So one of the control volumes we've talked about is a stream tube. So we can look at the fluid that goes in and the fluid that comes out. And so this expression here is really conservation of momentum. Oops. Conservation. <coughs> momentum, I'll just write it as MV. And that's what Bernoulli does for us. It is for a, a steady state. It's for an incompressible fluid. It's an inviscid fluid, no viscosity. We'll find out when we deal later that we can accommodate things like viscosity through losses in pipes, such as what are these terms are here. And we can also put energy into the system by, for instance, putting a pump in the stream tube that puts some power, head power, or head pump head into the system to drive flows or to take energy out as the opposite, right? The turbine takes energy out of the system, a centripetal pump puts in, but we'll deal with that in, in due course. So these extra terms that maybe you haven't been exposed to yet, we'll start adding when we start talking about fluids which are viscous, not inviscid, but are viscous, and also when we start looking at the energy equation, uh, which is why we, we'll look at it, I think it's next week. So Bernoulli basically allows us to solve for um, conservation of momentum. The normal to the streamlined behavior that we get is actually kind of the same. You see that this term here is a bit like this term, v squared over 2g. And this is solving the same kind of expression. It's actually solving f equals m a, where this particular a is a change in velocity with respect to time again. But instead of being along the streamline, which is what this is looking at, it's uh, perpendicular to it. So in other words, if you think of taking a, a, a little mass here and swinging it around your head, I guess this way, this is the, our sign convention, then the velocity that it has, uh, we talked about, is really v theta, this angular velocity. This is the radius that we're pulling it at. And of course, the force that we're applying is this force here that we have to apply to keep it going in that direction. So it is accelerating. This velocity is a constant speed, but because it's changing direction everywhere it goes on the arc by some angle theta, so as it goes around this at some angle theta, then it has to go not in this direction straight towards you, but it has to bend round. And so it has constant speed as it rotates, but it has a different velocity because it's going through some angular, uh, so it's angular acceleration, hence the term. And so this, not surprisingly, this is the mass times acceleration term here, and these are the, the force terms on either side, no different. And so there, there's some similarity between the expressions. And so both the behavior uh, along a streamline and normal to the streamline are definitions of conservation of momentum. So, so that may be just um, academic for you, and you might not care. 
And so what we will look at uh, in these coming three weeks, we will look at uh, conservation laws. And those conservation laws are, first of all, for mass conservation. Second of all, for, uh, I can't remember, I, th I think it's energy first. And third of all, for momentum. And it may seem a little esoteric that we're doing this, but certainly when, if you're solving the equations for porous media flow, the equations that you write, the differential equations are for conservation of mass, mass in equals mass out plus accumulation, and Darcy's law includes momentum. And if that means nothing to you now, don't worry about it because we don't need to deal with it. And so these are the things that we'll look at in these three successive weeks. So we've already actually dealt with a couple of them. And so you may realize that. Momentum, we've just said that we're conserving when we're looking at uh, Bernoulli's equation, both along and normal to streamline. We're conserving momentum. If we only have, in Bernoulli's equation, when we write it between an upstream location and a downstream location, we need to have six terms, pressure head, velocity head, and elevation head upstream, and also downstream. Um, it hasn't mattered so far whether we write one upstream and one downstream. We'll find out that when we have frictional loss terms or viscous loss terms, we always write number one as upstream, but that's just a convention. Um, but the other thing, if you only have four out of the six terms, you can close the set of equations by writing a continuity equation. And continuity is just a nice way of saying conservation of mass. It says that mass in equals mass out. And so in this case, if we multiplied by the upstream density and the downstream density, which would be the same because it's incompressible, then this is just a statement of mass rate in. So what are the units of this? Area times velocity is going to be meters squared meters per second. So this is meters cubed per second. <coughs> and density is kilo, bless you, kilograms per meter cubed. So this is a mass rate term. So it's mass rate of fluid in equals mass rate of fluid out. And so uh, there are fancier ways we can write that. And what we'll find out that is that when we write those equations, basically, if, if you're filling up a bucket, uh, differential equations are just a statement, if you like, of mass rate in. Minus mass rate out. equals accumulation. And so if it goes in at 5 cubic meters a second or 5 kilograms a second, comes out at 4 kilograms a second, then you're accumulating by definition 1 kilogram per second. And so you can write that as a flow into a bucket, uh, as we've just kind of described it. Or you could write it as flow into a little differential volume, as we've done, as we will, will also do. And so when we talk about control volumes, um, we've already dealt with two. One control, so for these conservation laws, we need to, to make some distinctions about exactly what we're going to do. And so the control volumes that we could use could be, uh, I guess, in the simplest form, it could be a bucket. Fluid in, fluid out equals accumulation. You could think of it as a, a kind of a, a, um, a unit component as well. People going into an elevator. Ten people go in per hour, nine people come out, then you accumulate one person per hour. This is that. You could, we've also dealt with um, descriptions which are little cubes, differential cubes, which on edge are length dx, dy, and dz. And we've also talked about control volumes, which are the one we've just drawn above, are between streamlines. This is a control volume. Volume goes in, volume comes out, and this expression comes directly out of this. So that's really what we're, we're attempting to, to deal with. And so when we talk about control volumes, we'll use this fancy sounding thing called Reynolds transport theorem, which allows us to write them in any general shape we want. 
and a streamline would be one of those uh, classes. Or so, so this is a general way of, of uh, doing it, named after the same Osborne Reynolds, you know, famous fluid mechanician, I guess, from the 1800s. And so we can also write them in uh, different reference frames. So that's really kind of where we're trying to get to, to today. And the reference frames that we're, we're dealing with uh, are the ones that we've talked about at the very top of this page, which is this. So that's what we'll attempt to, to try and explain. Okay. And so the very basic of this is, this is the, ba the basic idea, is that although we haven't said it, actually, let me, let me switch to something else. Let me switch to this. I'm going to start writing things down. So, so we need to talk a little bit about reference frames, or I'd like to talk about reference frames. So let's get on this. So we are six, one, um, control volumes. And specifically reference frames, or frames of reference, I guess. Or frame of reference. Okay, and so um, actually we've already used this a little bit. Um, I guess we certainly uh, have looked at the idea of this idea of, um, for instance, um, if I can draw it, talked about submarines, blah, 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 something on the back. I don't know what that is. This is the conning tower. And so the question is, what is the uh, dynamic pressure that's on the tip of this submarine as it moves through the water at some uh, velocity. V equals, it's not going to be a meter a second, but some s small number, I guess. I don't know that if it can even go that fast. I guess that is, uh, well, that's one mile an hour, right? I think that's half, one meter, one meter a second is two miles an hour. So I guess it can go that speed. And so the frame of reference is that because Bernoulli is written as a steady state, um, if we attached ourselves as a static observer, then at time zero, the submarine would be here. But at time zero plus one, the submarine would be here. And by definition, that's not steady state. Because a packet of water, which is here at that stage, now has a submarine overprinting it. So clearly, it's not looking the same. So what we could do is you can redefine this instead of a submarine moving at half a meter a second in this direction and water parting to go around it, you can take the submarine as being static and you can have the water flowing at half a meter a second. Right? And if you do that, you almost do it without thinking, but if you do that, then you know that the velocity here is half a meter a second, the velocity at the tip of this is zero because it's a stagnation point, and you can solve Bernoulli equation to get the pressure at that point if you make some assumptions that um, elevation doesn't change, etc. Right? You only have a four, four unknowns. You have a velocity here. You have a zero velocity here. The elevation is the same, so z doesn't change. And the pressure will change from this pressure to a dynamic pressure here, which is the one unknown you solve. For. And so this is a little bit similar to the idea of the, um, the fire boat in that, for instance, if we draw a frame of reference for this boat, which is x and z, and you know that if you're firing water out of here at one meter a second, then on the boat, it looks like it's coming out at one meter a second. But if the boat is also moving at one meter a second, then to an observer, the velocity of this water is equal to one meter a second plus, you know it. So it matters what your observer is. And of course, if you want to calculate um, momentum changes in a system, we have to figure out exactly what the reference frame is that we use. 
And so usually, if you're trying to figure out what the forces are on your feet as you go up in an elevator, we're sublim- well, subconsciously attaching the reference frame to ourselves. So you accelerate at one meter a second going upwards. We know that if we have a mass and we're accelerating, we know what the force would be if we know what our mass of our body is that would be applied in our feet as we do that. Because we're taking dv dt, our change in velocity with time that's attached to us. But if you go to uh, Hyatt, where they have these elevators, which are the glass doors, and you look at someone going up in an elevator, then you can see what velocity they're moving at. uh, But you'd like to be able to calculate from what you're seeing exactly what the force is that's applied to their feet. So one way to do that is to choose this, if you like, non-inertial reference frame. So let's do it first with, um, so let's make the point Um, Let's look first at scalar variables. And this is the simplest um, expression I know how to do this. So we made it. So let's say that we are um, looking at going down into the earth. Uh, we know that pressures and temperatures change with depth. Let's talk about pressure, uh, temperatures rather. You probably don't know it. You probably don't care, actually. The geothermal gradient. Well, I don't. Know, I shouldn't presume that. It's kind of rude, isn't it? Um, <laughs> so the geothermal gradient under our feet is probably something like um, 25 degrees centigrade, roughly 25 degrees centigrade per kilometer. That's a standard temperature change. If you want to have a geothermal field, you'd like it to be 50 degrees centigrade. So you can get to hot water with drilling less. And so we made the point that um, we can run a sonde down the hole. And this sonde would measure what the property is. Pressure, uh, the thing's called spinner logs, has a little impeller on it. You drop it down a hole and it measures the fluid velocity going past it. And if you measure the fluid velocity as you drop this down the hole, and if you measure it as you go up the hole at the same rate, subtract one from the other, you can see where water comes into your hole, goes along your hole, and goes out into different aquifers or different uh, reservoirs. And so they're, they're used standardly. And so what we could do is we could, if we're interested in figuring out exactly what the change in temperature is that we'd see as a function of time, Then let's say we go down the hole with this sond at one meter. Uh, Actually, let's not. Let's do it in units that make it easy for us. Let's say we go down at one kilometer an hour. So if we want to know exactly what the temperature is that we feel if we're attached to that sond in the S-O-N-D-E, by the way, this is what it is. be Latin. If we want to know how the temperature is that we see as we go down there, we can take this and we can write it, as you can imagine, as this. Oops. So, um, okay, sorry, that's, that's a, it should be a T, let me do this, yeah, sorry. And let me write this as, change, this is a DZ. And I suppose we could do some more, like, let's add an, an extra one for the X direction. Actually, let's add both of them. And we can talk about T, right? We made this point before, so I'm just writing the same thing out four times. And I'm going to change this to be X, and this to be Y. 
So you see that the red parts are just one, dx, dz over dz, and dx over dx. We made the point before that these things are all orthogonal to each other, so we're not getting three or four times this by writing it out, because they're, they don't have any mutual influence on each other. But the reason for doing this is that all of a sudden, this term here, by definition, is the velocity in the z direction. This is the velocity in the x direction. And this is the velocity in the y direction. And we don't, we could multiply this by t, I suppose, but it wouldn't change anything, right? Because this would be the logical one. And so this is merely a statement of the fact that we live in a four-dimensional world, three Cartesian coordinates and changes in time. And that this expression is given by change in temperature with time. And I'm only going to write this first one out. Change in time with location in the z direction uh, multiplied by velocity in the z direction. So this is referring to the fact that we want to figure out exactly what we feel as we go down on this sand on the elevator into the Earth and how quickly we'd see things change. And so we know that if we look at this, if we look at this temperature gradient now, it looks like this. If you look at it in 10 minutes' time, it looks like this. So by definition, in this particular case, this term is zero. There's no change in temperature with time. This is T. In the Greek. This one? This is T. Overwrite. This is, no, it's just, that's just a bad Z. It is a Z. <laughs> you couldn't tell us a Z? <laughs> Said. <laughs> and so um, this is a Z. And so this is how temperature changes Z. And so what is that in this case? Is this correct, I guess? It's not. It's not quite correct. This should be minus. So this, by definition, is minus 25 degrees C per kilometer. Um, yes, right. And the velocity is what? Plus or minus? Excellent. So, so this turns out that this gives us the change in temperature with time that we'd see, which is going to be equal to, uh, it's going to be, well, you can see how it works out, which is going to be equal to uh, minus, no, plus, plus 25, and it's going to be degrees C per kilometer, and kilometers per hour. So, so we go down one mile. We spend an hour going down, we'll go down one kilometer. If we start off at zero at the top, we'll add 25 degrees centigrade at a kilometer, and we'll see it in an hour. And so this is exactly the rate of change that you see as you go down here. But what we're doing is we're putting it together from something, a static view of what this is. And so we're looking at this. This temperature isn't changing in time. Hence, this term is zero. Uh, and therefore, we're able to move from one reference frame, a moving reference frame, which goes down with this sand to calculate how temperature changes as we go down. And we've done it from looking at how things are in a static reference frame. If we make it a bit more exciting, maybe, and assume that maybe the temperature changes um, with time. So in other words, instead of this being zero, it wouldn't be zero at the top. It would be 20 degrees centigrade here, and it would go down to the bottom, but let's not worry about that. Let's say it changes by, um, for some reason, we can't, I mean, it's stupid, but that's just for illustration. It changes by one degree C per hour. Then this, this expression would just be slightly rearranged to give us change in temperature with time is equal to uh, one degrees centigrade per hour bloop, bloop, plus the same term here minus 25 degrees C per kilometer times minus one kilometer per hour and so you add these two terms together 
then it gives you a rate which should be equal to, I guess, 26. Per hour. So that's it. And so all this is saying that in one hour, this will look like this. So after one hour, it would look like this. After two hours, I guess, the distribution of temperatures would look like this. And so if it takes you an hour to get from here to one kilometer depth, so if this is one kilometer, we know that you'd switch from this one here to this one here. And so the trajectory would look like this. And so you can see it's steeper by some small amount. So instead of being 25 degrees centigrade per hour, it's, sorry, 25 centigrade per hour, it's 26. That's it, that's it. That's all it is. And so that's all we need to, to understand. And so it may seem kind of esoteric again that we're doing this, but the important thing is it allows us, this is what's attached to us. So we've done it for temperature as it changes. Temperature is by definition a scalar value. It has magnitude but no direction. So you have one component at a point. The expressions that we'd like to look at, I'll leave that here so you can see the bottom part of that, are that we've said that a lot of the stuff in terms of conservation of momentum which of course includes Bernoulli equation, rely on the fact that the sum of forces is equal to mass times change in velocity with time. And we, we've always written it with a partial, but it really is a substantial derivative, and you can rationalize this yourself. The reason we didn't tackle this first is that this is definitely a, a vectoral quantity, not a scalar. We have forces in x, y, and z, and we have velocities in x, y, and z. And so there are three components of this, and the three components of this. But we know the forces that are going to be applied, because we said if we go up in an elevator, it's the, the acceleration that we feel as we're accelerated going up in this elevator that gives us the forces that are in our feet if it accelerates upwards, and reduces those forces if it free falls or accelerates downwards. And so it really is this substantial derivative that we need to, to deal with. And so what we could do is we could do the same as we've done before. And let's make life easy for ourselves and just take one component. So this would be a vector which is velocity in x, velocity in y, and velocity in z. And this would be a sum of forces in the x direction whoops, in the y direction and the z direction. This, this term here, that's what they physically look like. But let's just take one of those terms. And so one of the terms would be that the forces in the x direction are equal to mass times the rate of change of velocity with time in the x direction. This is going to be the force, right? So we, we can take this. And so I suppose we can take this. This is the only term that we're interested in. So let's not worry about the mass. So let's figure out exactly what this would look like. Change of velocity in the x direction with time. We just do exactly the same as we did before. We have change with uh, velocity in the x direction with time plus change in velocity in the x direction with time. This is a t on the bottom in all of these for now. And there'll be four of them. And you kind of can guess the punchline, I think, right? This is going to be with time, so we don't change that. This is going to be with respect to the x direction. This is going to be with respect to the y direction. And this is going to be with respect to the z direction. And 
if we write those out, I'm going to collapse this first one, change in velocity in the x direction, <coughs> how it changes with time at a single point. So this is at a single point. Uh, let's just make the point that what are these? This by definition is velocity in x. This by definition is velocity in y. This by definition is velocity in z. And so we can write those out vx. I'm just going to, you'll see where they come. I'm just trying to use colors to make it a bit more apparent what I'm doing. So this term here will be change in velocity in the x direction with x, change in the velocity in the x direction with y, and change in the velocity in the x direction with z. So. And so that allows us to be able to calculate this term arbitrarily. And so these terms um, mean something. Uh, this is, um, so this is the reference frame. attached to me in an elevator, or you, I guess. And this is the reference frame that is static. And so if I, s I'll leave that there for a moment, but I mean, in, in terms of this, uh, the, the problem that we just solved, Yep, go ahead. Question? Excellent. Thank you. So in terms of this, what we just did, this was temperature versus depth. This is the static reference frame. This is what we're looking at. This gives us a, this is D, Z, and this is dt. I know we're talking about velocities. So this is the static reference frame, which is here. And as we go down in this sign here, this is how temperature changes with time, attached to whatever is going down our elevator. So that's, that's it. And so a more fluidy example would be you know, a leaf floating downstream. The leaf's moving with the current. If you're standing on the bank, it has some velocity relative to you. So if you know the velocity of the current, you can calculate what the velocity is, or the acceleration is that the leaf is seeing. It's actually seeing no acceleration because it's moving with the velocity of the current. And if the velocity doesn't change, then there, by definition, there's no acceleration. So these are referred to as convective accelerations. acceleration, ACCM. And it means it's not changing with time, it's changing with space. So the velocity multiplied by a change in velocity with space is acceleration uh, because it uh, is changing velocity. By definition, a change in velocity has to, uh, is defined as an acceleration. So everyone okay with that? Let's so let's give a quick example. Oh, I didn't need to do that. How do I do this? Okay. Let's go back to these notes. So we've gone through this. We've gone through this. We talked about, well, we'll talk about reference frames. Uh, I guess I didn't really talk about control volumes. But let's go just through this example here. We made the point that this looks like we've done it for x. And so we end up with a set of these equations that is for the accelerations in the x direction. These are the ones that we just had. This is what your book uses. It uses uh, velocity in u is velocity in x, v is velocity in y, and w is in z. And so these acceleration terms are just given in this particular form. Uh, it's more complicated if it's a scalar because you have three of these components versus a tensor. Uh, a, sorry. It's more 
complicated if you have a vectoral quantity or a tensor because it has three components instead of just one. But ultimately, its use is that if you have a velocity field which you know what it is, you can calculate what the accelerations are. And I guess the, to make it maybe more meaningful to you is that you know that if... It's my computer, don't worry. You know that if you have streamlines that were doing this and that A1 and A2, if A1 is greater than A2, by definition, the velocity V2 has to be bigger than the velocity V1, right? So in going from upstream to downstream, it has had to go faster. If it's gone faster with moving downstream, it's accelerated. It's gone through a convective acceleration. And this convective acceleration, if this, for instance, were the x direction, would be this. A change in velocity in the x direction with x multiplied by its velocity. So that would be the acceleration that it would see. But this is the acceleration due to all components. The flow might not only be in the x direction, but it might be skew from that. But there are components of the acceleration which are defined that contribute to the acceleration in the x direction due to these other components. And so if you have a velocity field that, for instance, is given by this, that the velocity is equal to, so in other words, if you have a point here which is x and y, and you have at this point a velocity field which is the velocity in the x direction was equal to 2 times x, which means it's increasing as you go to the right, which is this. And the velocity in the y direction was equal to vy is equal to minus y. So the velocity would increase as you go down in, 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 in this direction. And the velocity in the z direction is equal just to its location. Then basically you can plug these numbers into this for the velocity and the change in velocity just by differentiating this and you end up with the magnitude of the acceleration. And so that's exactly what's done. This is an example from your book, but it's basically done here. The acceleration x would be all the terms on this component. There's no component here that changes with time. So these components are all identically zero. The only components are that there's a component in x which if you take the derivative of x, this would give you minus 2, which is just the derivative, sorry, plus 2. The change in velocity in the x direction, if you differentiate with y, is 0. So this is 0, as is this. There's a component that defines velocity, which is equal to minus y. The derivative of velocity in the y direction with y is going to be equal to minus 1 multiplied by itself, minus y. And the only other term that exists is going to be this term here. The velocity in the z direction, the derivative of this is going to be 1, and multiplied through by this. And so if you calculate exactly what the accelerations of this particle are, then it comes out the, the acceleration of that particle in the x direction is just equal to this one term here, which is this which is the velocity, which is 2x, multiplied through by the derivative of the velocity, which is plus 2, this term here. The acceleration in the y direction, it's only this one term here, which is equal to the velocity in the y direction, which is minus y, multiplied through by the derivative of that, which is minus 1. And likewise for the velocity, the, the acceleration in the, in the z direction, it's equal to the magnitude of that velocity, which is z, multiplied by its derivative with respect to z, which is 1. And so if you write these out, it sends up uh, well, the terminology they use in the book. 2 times x times 2 is 4, so this. And this is the acceleration in the x direction. And this is just the vector, which is aligned in the x direction. So you know that if you have a coordinate system, which is x, y, and z, 
Then 1, 0, 0 is the vector aligned in the x direction, which is this. The vector aligned in the y direction is going to be 0, 1, 0. And the vector aligned in the z direction, which is k, is 0, 0, 1. And so if you wanted to know, for instance, what the acceleration is uh, in these directions, it's going to be equal to, you could just write this out in longhand, ax, ay, az is equal to 4x. getting bored minus y and plus c so for that particle at that any particular point you could choose any point I guess if you choose the coordinates of that point as x equals 1, y equals 1, and z equals 1, then this would just be, you put a value for that. If you put a value of 0 for those, I guess all the accelerations are 0, right? Because this this multiplier. So the reason for this is basically that we need to have the reference frame free. When we calculate forces that are applied on things, it's relative to the, the moving reference frame because it's being accelerated. Sometimes you want to define that in terms of a static reference. And that static would be a flow field that we see. And if we know what that flow field is, and we can get the derivatives of those, as we've done here, basically we can figure that out. That's it. Yes? For that bottom is that uh, the y component supposed to be negative or positive? For the z... The y. This is negative, yeah? Isn't it negative? Is it a negative times a negative? Oh, yeah, you're right. It's positive, yeah. Thank you. Yes, all right. Okay, great.